Thank you, Brother Daryl, Father Stephen, so much. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's a great gift to me to be with you during this Holy Week in Washington, D.C., the Catholic University of America. It's a very special evening. Welcome everyone online from wherever you are. It's a great gift for you to be joining this gathering also. So tonight, the talk entitled Anatomy of the Soul, St. Teresa of Avila on the Interior Castle. And I think the very first takeaway point is what she's writing about is you. You. Your interior castle. You have one of these. You are one of these. As the Carmelite saints talk about the human soul is God's heaven on earth. God wants to dwell there, to circulate through our souls. You are a treasure. You are a pearl of great price for God. You are the beloved. This is the first and most important point. So the Carmelite saints teach us over and over that the human soul is God's dwelling where God wants to dwell. Since the Paschal mystery of Jesus has taken place, and the Blessed Virgin Mary is the first beneficiary of this gift of God through her fiat, that God would take up residence within her, within her womb, within her heart. And through the Paschal Mystery of Christ, the Sacrament of Baptism, and all the sacraments of the Church, that God wants to do the same with each one of us. This is our common human vocation, and it's so amazing to remember this, because so often we forget about it. Our senses are attuned to this exterior world, everything else going out, going on out there. Earlier today, I took two flights, one from South Bend, Indiana to Chicago, and the second from Chicago to Washington, D.C., Reagan Airport. And then I took a lift ride uh, to yeah. Whitefriars yeah. Hall. And I had an itinerary, point A to point B, point C, point D, and it all made sense, and it was a lot of fun. And I got a nice fruit bar on the plane and some orange juice. Um, but we don't tend to think about the itinerary of interiority. This ethical summons, this ethical excellency of the journey we are to make within this marvelous castle of the soul, your soul and my soul. So this is what this is all about tonight in Holy Week, the anatomy of the soul. What is this anatomy? What do we learn from Mother Teresa of Jesus? So I'm going to share my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and I also have a handout here. If anyone at home wants a copy of this, uh, you can get it uh, by emailing me or I'm sure Brother Darrell, Brother Stephen. And I'm going to um share this slideshow full screen from the beginning there we are the anatomy of the soul i love this picture of saint Teresa of avila it's just so wow mystical i was trying to get rid of these people on the side and beautiful so i love to feature it slide one but here's a picture of another okay. Carmelite saint, Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, also known as Edith Stein. And she says something very important because when it comes to this mystical journey within, there's two extremes to be avoided. The first is that it's not for me because it's for those spiritual masters, those elite ones like these mystical saints it's for them, but it's not for me. That's one extreme to be avoided. The other extreme is that it's it's so common that it's nothing special. There's no work to be done. It's automatic. So it's something, the truth about Christian mysticism, it's something in between these uh, faulty extremes. That all of us are called to the mystical journey into the most interior recesses of the soul. Because that is where the king lives, Jesus Christ. And where there's Jesus Christ, there's the most holy trinity. So St. Edith Stein says, 
there's quite a distance between leading the self-satisfied existence of the quote unquote good Catholic who does his duty, reads the right newspaper and votes correctly, and then does just as he pleases and living one's life in the presence of God. There's a difference with the simplicity of a child and the humility of the publican. But I can assure you, she says, once anyone has taken the first step, he won't want to turn back. Anyone know what she's talking about? Yes, once you've taken the first step, you don't want to turn back. You want to go the distance. You want to arrive at the final destination, union with God, spiritual marriage. So we begin with the end in mind, the seventh dwelling places. That's what she's going to talk about. We're going to get there at the very end. But we begin with the end in mind. We don't start climbing the mountain unless we have in mind its summit. There's a destination, there's a goal. We're going there step by step and it's worth every step. But we have to focus on the summit and yearn for the summit and move toward the summit. So this is an encouraging message that it's very inclusive, it's very universal. All of us are called to the same summit that is Jesus Christ. So again, who is the mystic? Again, to quote St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross, the mystic is simply a person who has an experiential knowledge, a real lived knowledge of the teaching of the church. Most especially the teaching that God dwells in the soul. Did you know the Catholic Church teaches this? Yes. We read it in scripture multiple places. Pope Leo XIII speaks about this in his 1897 encyclical Divinum Illud Munus, about the indwelling of the Holy Trinity in the soul, a whole section on it. This is a real teaching of the church. And St. Teresa Avila teaches us so much more in detail about what this means. Then to quote St. Thomas Aquinas too, what is this mystical love that reaches for the spiritual union with God that already finds God reaching for us? It's a love that wants to love more than it already has, than it already is right now. To desire to love God more than I already love God. It is this desire that fulfills the precept of charity, the twofold commandment of love of Jesus, love of God, love of neighbor. And as St. Edith Stein says, for the Christian, there are no strangers, only neighbors. So this desire, with the help of St. Thomas Aquinas, to think about this, to love God more than I already love God. With St. Teresa of Avila too, we discover that each one of us is created to become a mystic in as much as the call and the prize are the same for each one of us. The perfection of charity and union of the soul with God who is uncreated love itself. So this interior castle, this work of St. Teresa serves as a vivid narrative roadmap of a universal spiritual itinerary anchored in a common destination. The communio sanctorum, the communion of angels and saints and communion with the most holy trinity. St. Teresa in this work hosts us as a tour guide of the soul's interior peregrination, that is pilgrimage journey toward permanent union with the most holy trinity. So what about this work, the interior castle, finished in the year 1577, only five years before her death in 1582, when she was only 62 years old at the time of the completion of this work. But the actual time she spent writing the interior castle, allegedly, was only two months. This vast work, only two months, and in spite of many interruptions. She's making all these foundations around Spain and interrupted with, with many matters, but she still writes this 
out of obedience to her spiritual director, Father Jeronimo Gracian, who ordered her under obedience to write this book because her autobiography was being held in suspenseful scrutiny by the Spanish Inquisition at the time. So at first, St. Teresa admits she felt great aversion to writing this book, the task of it, though she trusted the hidden powers of obedience. And it goes by several Spanish titles, El Castillo Interior, the interior castle, Las Moradas, the dwellings, the dwelling places, or a combination of the two, Las Moradas del Castillo Interior. In this work, St. Teresa shares about her lived experiences with, in the spiritual life of a Carmelite nun. And the immediate audience of the writing are fellow Carmelite nuns. So I have to keep that in mind as she's writing. It's, it's a very specific audience. And we have to contextualize it as we read it. And she says in the prologue that she uses the language that's used between women, even too, which is also very significant. A women writing, especially for women. So us, us men especially have to be aware of this as we try to read the work and understand what she's saying. The spiritual expansiveness of the soul is spoken of under the allegory of a castle with many dwelling places. Seven groups of dwelling places in total. And the power of allegory and symbol is to express what is virtually inexpressible. The first three groups of dwelling places begin um, with the stage of spiritual purification no, 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 and the active phases of demasiado. prayer, including vocal prayer, the prayer of meditation, also called mental prayer, and the beginnings of the active prayer of recollection, which starts to transition into the prayer of contemplation proper. Then the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh groups of dwelling places move into the passive mystical stages of prayer, namely the passive prayer of recollection, the prayer of quiet, and the prayer of union. And this is where supernatural experiences proliferate in the life of the soul. The gate of entry into the interior castle itself, she says, is prayer. La puerta de este castillo es oración. Oración. And she's very mindful that if she says something not in conformity with the Holy Roman Catholic Church holds, it will be through ignorance and not malice. And she says she'll always be subjective to the magisterial teaching authority of the church, which is reassuring at the outset. So let's think then about the first dwelling places. In presenting about the interior castle, I would tend to say most about these. Are we in? The castle even is a good question. A lot of us, followers of Christ, might assume we're somewhere far, far inside. We must be, right? I've been at this years following Jesus and receiving the sacraments. I must be somewhere rather far inside. Well, let's find out. She says, we consider our soul to be like a castle made entirely out of diamonds or a very clear crystal in which there are many rooms, just as in heaven there are many dwelling places. She goes on to say, for in reflecting upon it carefully, we realize that the soul of the just person, el alma del justo, is nothing else but a paradise where the Lord says he finds his delight. And that's how Pope Leo XIII writes about God dwelling in the soul. He always qualifies not just any soul, but the soul of a just person, a righteous person made righteous, of course, by God's grace. We don't make ourselves righteous by ourselves. That's Pelagianism, mm -hmm. heresy, St. Augustine contended with. But God makes us just. God makes us worthy of love precisely by loving us. So St. Teresa uses many Spanish words to refer to these rooms within the castle, moradas, aposentos, and piezas, rooms, habitations. 
chambers, lodgings, mansions, can be translated so many different ways. Sister Ruth Burroughs, 20th century British Carmelite, in her book, Fire Upon the Earth, writes that the human being is a capacity for God in this respect. This is her commentary on the interior castle. The human being is a capacity for God. He comes into existence in so far as he consents to be what he is, a for Godness. The human being is meant to be a for Godness, to exist for God. Yes. And the best place to find God is within the self. At the center of the self is not the self, it's a vacancy. It's called the God-shaped hole sometimes. At the center of the self is the holy other, the divine other. This is where we should seek God. This is what St. Teresa teaches us about this wonderful science of love. She says, the soul is advised to enter within itself. It is necessary to move beyond the outside wall of the castle into the interior recesses of the castle. For she says, insects and vermin, sabandijas y bestias, surround and dwell within the wall of the castle. And these vermin can be defined as animals that compete with humans for food, also translatable as reptiles. St. Teresa confirms that the spiritual life is an interior battle and presents us with a combative idea of how to enter the soul. Do we want to become like the vermin or move past them? The door of entry into this castle, as said before, is prayer and reflection. La puerta para entrar es este castillo, es la oración y consideración. Reflection, consideration, thoughtfulness. The movements of humility and self-knowledge. We move into the first and then the second dwelling places. But the soul is very dynamic, very interesting. A great topography, a great spiritual landscape awaits us here, what God wants to show us. Teresa compares it to the palmetto plant that has many leaves surrounding and covering the tasty part that can be eaten. The things of the soul must always be considered as plentiful, spacious, and large, plentiful, spacious, and large, having the capacity of ongoing expansion and dilation. So she says, we should think of the soul not in terms of just a few rooms, but in terms of a million. Anyone ever read the book by Dr. Seuss, The Places You Will Go? Oh, the places you'll go. How about for your own soul, the places within your soul, you can go, you can explore what God has to show you. There are many wonderful things. So this whole exterior world is a faint reflection of this more exciting interior one. This is better than Disney World. This is better than Mount Everest. This is better than anywhere a plane or a boat or a train or car or foot could take us. What awaits inside? If there's an exterior world, surely there, it implies there's an interior one. Where do we have to explore here? So think of the soul like this palmetto plant. Again, think of the necessity of humility. She says, humility is a favor of God through which we see how none of our good deeds has its principle from ourselves, but from this fountain which the tree symbolizing our souls is planted and from this sun that gives warmth to our works. And she likens humility also to the bee making honey and the beehive, always at work, 
without it, everything goes wrong. If you've ever observed bees coming to and from the beehive, it's all day long. All day long. No, no stop. And she says, love is never idle. It's either growing or decreasing. We have to work. Jesus says his father is always at work. And humility is like this. There's always more work to be done. If we think we've become perfectly humble, we're missing the point. <laughs> it's always calling us to something more. As we read in the book of Proverbs, I believe it is, humble yourself, the mm -hmm. greater you are, and you will be loved more than a giver of gifts. It's a great paradox, a great Jewish paradox. Humble yourself, the more, the greater you are. So if I think I'm great, I, okay, I need to humble myself all the more. It helps reveal the truth about ourselves in relation to God, as St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, that we hold this treasure in earthen vessels to show that the power is from God and not from ourselves. Humility is necessary to arrive at self-knowledge, true self-knowledge. Humility and always humility. In the way of perfection, Teresa of Avila talks about three main things. Detachment, humility, and love. These are primary for the Carmelite way. So with this, we move then with great trepidation to the second dwelling places. And she says, these rooms involve much more effort than the first. But the good news is that these persons who are moving into the second dwelling places have learned to hear the Lord when he calls, to recognize his voice. As Jesus says in the book of Revelation, he who listens to my voice and hears my voice as I stand at the door and knock and opens the door, I will come in to him and sup with him. We recognize the voice of the master, the voice of the good shepherd. In the second dwelling places, she says, this is the stage that pertains to those who have already begun the practice of prayer and have understood how important it is not to stay in the first dwelling places. The first dwelling places, we compromise with sin too much. And we can examine our conscience and know how often is this compromise with sin happening? Are these habits of sin showing up? Are we wanting them to be uprooted? C.S. Lewis has this great book, uh, the, the Great Divorce. And there's a scene where a guy in purgatory, he has an attachment to lustful desire and is symbolized as like a reptile on his shoulder. And the angel comes up to him and says, can I kill it? <laughs> and he says, well, it usually stays quiet. It, it usually behaves. I don't think it's necessary you kill it. That seems kind of drastic. But the angel keep presses, presses him, can I kill it? Can I kill it? And finally, he yields, he surrenders, he gives in, and he's transformed. And he's perfectly purified. So it is with, with all the sin that can in, have this infestation huh. in those outer walls of the castle. But the second stage involves this determination. Teresa of Avila talks a lot about this determinada, determinación, determined determination. This is what's required to keep moving. As St. Paul says, press on toward the goal, run so as to win. We have to work. We have to depend on the grace of God, but we have to collaborate with it and be hard at work. St. John of the Cross talks about this. We should be more inclined to hard work than to leisure. Leisure has its place, but we should be inclined to hard work. To move into the second stage, we start to do away with the occasions of sin, which leads to the third stage, 
which gets more radical, something more and more radical with each stage of these dwelling places. The third dwelling places begin with the fear of the Lord. She quotes Psalm 121, verse 1, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord. Blessing comes with this fear of the Lord, which is one of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, gifts of the Holy Spirit to be received. Because when we fear the Lord, we remain on the secure path to our salvation. Al camino seguro de su salvación. The third dwelling places are entered because of winning many spiritual battles in the first and second dwelling places. According to her own autobiography, St. Teresa herself remained in the third dwelling places for 10 years of her life before proceeding to the fourth through the seventh ones. 10 years of this amazing woman's life. She says, I was here. But this sums up what's going on in the third dwelling places. Fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum. Fiat voluntas tua secutin celo et in terra. To be one with the will of God. To be won over by the will of God. For the will of the self to be, in a sense, dispossessed. And liberated. To be united to the freedom of the will of God. So she writes, if it is your will, my God, may we die with you. So this intentionality of wanting to die with Christ. As St. Paul says, I resolve to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I want to die with you so that I'll rise with you. As St. Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, I make up in my own body, known sufferings of my body, what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, the church. And I realize that living without Christ, as well as the fears that accompany the possibility of losing him forever, is nothing else than dying often. That's what we're taught over and over in this liturgical cycle of this Holy Week, of moving to the Easter Triduum, Holy Thursday and Good Friday. To long to die with Christ, not just to get it over with, not just to gloss over and get, get to Holy Saturday and Easter Sunday, but to target, have our sights set on the cross itself. To unite our sufferings with his to joyfully die with him. Because that itself is the beginning of rising with him. So the souls in the third dwelling places long not to offend his majesty, even guarding themselves against venial sins. St. Ignatius Loyola says many similar things in his spiritual exercises, the three ways of humility, for example. Not wanting to offend his majesty, his divine majesty, becoming fond of doing penance, setting aside periods for recollection, sus horas de recogimiento, this prayer, la oración de recogimiento, the prayer of recollection, the beginning of contemplative prayer, where the soul gathers up all its faculties, all its potencies. And so we have this handout and refer to this prayer on the first page with a footnote where she talks about it in the way of perfection. So you can read more about that there. But this spiritual ascent, this itinerary within, inward, upward, outward. It's a threefold movement of the soul. It's a very paradoxical movement that the deeper we go within, the higher we ascend on Mount Carmel, and the further we go out in solicitude for the other person who faces me. The third dwelling places are very aware of all of this. Souls here spend their time well practicing works of charity towards their neighbors. They're very balanced in their use of speech and dress, 
and in governing of their households, those who have them. And they really begin to desire more than ever the final dwelling place. La postrera morada, the final dwelling place, the seventh dwelling places. So here then we continue on to the fourth dwelling places. In the fourth dwelling places here are where supernatural experiences begin, she says. Especially what she calls gustos, we say in English spiritual delights, and contentos, consolations. Gustos and contentos. But she's, she's careful to say that we want to be very careful about the idolatry of these two. We don't proceed to gather up all the gustos and contentos like Pac-Man gobbling up the little dots. That's not the point. These are a means to an end. They accompany the soul's route to God. They're not God in themselves, but they're very wonderful experiences. The deep sense of joy, peace, the shalom of Christ, the satisfaction that's acquired as a result of prayer and virtuous living. How good it is to be washed and anointed by the sacraments of the church. How good it is. So we have a host who disabled screen sharing. I don't know who the host is, but I have a sneaking suspicion. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I'm trying here with the share screen. It just says host disabled purchase in screen sharing. So I guess it's the host. Yeah, we're the host. Yeah, the host. That's why I have both the handout and the PowerPoint. So okay. Oh, is it now you're the host? Oh now I'm the host. We'll take it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> There we go. Thank you very much. So, supernatural experiences begin here, especially in the fourth dwelling places. And she says that this true experience of consolation ends in the desire to please God and enjoy his majesty's company. So it's, it's very interesting to see. It's not for the desire for more consolation. But it, it involves this inversion of the self, this inversion of the incurvatus in se, the curving in of the self. It's being unfolded with the end of the desire to please God and enjoy his majesty's company. God himself is the prize, not something God gives, not something on the side of God, but God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, so then the fifth dwelling place is, again, getting an intensification of the spiritual life. She calls the fifth dwelling places the precious pearl of contemplation. Esta preciosa margarita. Margarita in Spanish. The precious pearl of contemplation awaits. And this is the teaching of the church about prayer, this movement, this gradual movement, according to the law of gradualism, becoming very acquainted with vocal prayer and always vocal prayer. The prayer of meditation, discursive reasoning, but this precious pearl of contemplation also awaits. It's so valuable. And what we can experience here if we strive and cooperate with divine grace. All the faculties here are asleep. This is how she describes it. And truly asleep to the things of the world and to ourselves. So St. John of the Cross uses the image of the dark night. And it's a twofold dark night of the senses and of the spirit. But it's a gradual putting to sleep of the senses toward this union with God. Not the senses are bad in themselves, 
but there's so much that needs to be overcome. There's so many uh, disordered appetites and affections that need to be detached. And they tend, the attachments happen through the senses primarily. There's also a lot of spiritual idols to be overcome in the dark night of spirit. But the first step is the dark night of sense and the gradual detachment and purification of the senses. It's like one who in every respect, she says, has died to the world so as to live more completely in God. The death, though, is a delightful one because in truth, it seems that in order to dwell more perfectly in God, the soul is so separated from the body that I don't even know if it has life to breathe. It's just an anticipation of the separation of soul and body that will happen at death which is a necessary passage of purification for the final consummation of our integrated being of body and soul, resurrected body and soul to happen. And she says those little lizards, unas lagartijillas, cannot enter the fifth dwelling places. So there's much security once the soul moves here the little lizards, those reptiles, those vermin, aren't trespassing. The six dwelling places then are very interesting and we're moving to the end. We'll have some time for some discussion, some question and answer at the end. She writes the most about the six dwelling places. It takes up a third of the whole work of the interior castle. She devotes 11 chapters to it, many more than the rest of them. Why this? Because... There's so many profound things happening in these six dwelling places as the soul moves into the prayer of quiet, toward the prayer of union. She says the soul feels a strange solitude because no creature in all the earth provides it company. Nor do I believe would any heavenly creature not being the one whom it loves. Rather, everything torments it. John Paul II also talks about this original solitude in his theology of the body and a certain meaning of the term. But there's a truth about the self. There's a solitariness about the self that no other person can access. Something that happens only between the soul and God that is entirely secret. Not even your spouse has access if you're married. And I found this to be very interesting as a married man, that there's this solitude about this soul that's for God alone, but it's experienced as a strange solitude because we could think that all this light is starting to shine forth, but there's this great stage of darkness, of passing through darkness that has to happen, this night of the spirit to move toward the seventh dwelling places. And so much suffering is involved here because it's a painful procedure to be detached from all of these things that we love in this life. All of these desires and ambitions and dreams and goals and even attachments of worry and anxiety, perturbation. But as Brother Jail prayed in the opening prayer, Nada te turbe. Let nothing disturb you. So for this to happen, we have to pass through the fire. But it's a loving fire. It's not a destructive fire. It's a purifying fire. St. Paul says, our God is a consuming fire. Here is where there's much transport and ecstasy. In the six dwelling places, the soul is wounded with love for its spouse and <laughs> strives for more, more opportunities to be alone and in conformity with its state in life, to rid itself of everything that can be an obstacle to this blessed, beautiful solitude with God. This is the Carmelite intuition. 
how wonderful it is to be alone with God and the secret of one's soul. And now we want to seek that out. We want to make it happen. And so we have to go to the right environment. We have to carve out the time. We have to place ourselves there. And when we place ourselves there, frequently, habitually, wonderful things happen. And in a sense, it becomes easier. At first, it seems like no fun. It seems painful, maybe torturous, to be alone with God. But over time, it's the pearl of great price. We realize that. But a severe suffering, she says, esta pena grande, it must come so that one may enter the seventh dwelling places. In her own experience, she felt a blow felt from elsewhere, her soul pierced with a fiery arrow. Okay. Una saeta de fuego, a sharp wound. Mas agudamente hiere. The sudden flash of lightning, este rayo, reduces to dust everything it finds in this earthly nature of ours. For while this experience lasts, nothing can be remembered about our being. She says, Lord, how you afflict your lovers. Señor, como apretáis a vuestros amadores. It's natural that what is worth much costs much, she says. Those who will enter heaven must be cleansed in purgatory. The pain itself is precious. For truly, she says, the suffering is no less than death. We must die with Christ to live with him. Finally, the seventh dwelling place is the arrival of spiritual marriage, which is preceded by spiritual betrothal. Again, a gradual process, like a man and woman preparing for marriage, not eloping, but a time of preparation, of growing in friendship, of engagement. And then finally, the wedding day. The total gift of self is given and received. And the purpose of one's existence is fully realized once and for all. So St. Teresa confesses having entered the seventh dwelling places on November 18th, 1572, after receiving the Eucharist from the hand of St. John of the Cross. She writes that the Lord here joins the soul to himself. El Señor la junta contigo. But he does so by making it blind and deaf, as was St. Paul in his conversion, and by taking away perception of the nature and kind of favor enjoyed. For the great delight the soul then feels is to see itself near God. She talks about it as an intellectual vision not of the body or even the soul. Yet when he joins it to himself, it doesn't understand anything, for all the faculties are lost, the intellect, the memory, the will, the effective life, all the faculties of the soul are lost in the rapture of this union. When the soul is brought into that dwelling place, the most blessed trinity, all three persons, through an intellectual vision, is revealed to it through a certain representation of the truth. Por cierta manera de representación de la verdad. A certain representation of the truth. The truth. God is the truth. God reveals the truth to us about ourselves. This happens in the extreme interior. In Spanish, en lo muy, muy interior. We say translate extreme interior, muy, muy, very, very deep, deep interior of the soul. And the soul perceives this divine company there. 
Siente en sí, perceive, we feel in the self, esta divina compañía. This is the divine and spiritual marriage. El divino y espiritual matrimonio. This great favor does not come to its perfect fullness, though, as long as we live. It can begin in this life, but it's lacking its fullness as long as we are at home in the body and away from the Lord, as St. Paul says. In Philippians, at the beginning, he'd rather depart and be united with Christ. But if God wills for him to remain in the body, it's for the good of the kingdom. Finally, she says that the point of this marriage is not a selfish one. Carmelite spirituality, again, it's a movement inward for the divine other, upward toward the celestial divine other, outward toward the neighbor. So she says, the sisters Mary and Martha we read about in St. Luke's Gospel must join together. She says, let us desire and be occupied in prayer, not for the sake of our enjoyment, but to have the strength to serve. Believe me, Martha and Mary must join together in order to show hospitality to the Lord and have him always present and not host him badly by failing to give him something to eat. How would Mary, after all, always seated at his feet, provide him with food if her sister did not help her? His food is that in every way possible, we draw souls that they may be saved and praise him always. So there's a missionary dimension to this interior castle, a great paradox. Pope Francis talks about it in terms of the systolic and diastolic movement of the church the diastolic contemplative dimension where there's that expansion, there's the dilation of soul so that there can be the systolic missionary launch into the world to bring back the catch into the church, the launch into the world to be salt, leaven, and light, to bring back weary souls into the sheepfold of grace. Pope Francis also talks about it as a centrifugal and centripetal movement, centripetal, inward, interior, and then the exhale, the exterior, centrifugal going out, going out and coming in. Ite, misa est. The dismissal is here. And so it is with the interior castle at the very end, the seventh dwelling places. We've gone all this way inside only to be launched outside. And there's a readiness, there's an availability with this Carmelite spirituality, a welcoming, a hospitality of interruption. It's no problem. It's another occasion of love. It's wonderful. And this contemplative conversion helps us see the world just like this. Thank you all so much. It's been a pleasure. Um, yes, yeah, so